My name is Raymond Bartolo. I was born in Grove City in uh, May 19th, 1923. Uh, uh, and where I lived until uh, when I was about 19, then I volunteered to uh, join the Army. In 1943, Ray joined the 97th Infantry Division and was assigned to the Communications Center. His division was sent from the United States to Belgium, where they joined in the Battle of the Bulge. From there, the soldiers were sent down to southern Germany. I was uh, in charge of a wire crew where we laid the telephone wires to the front lines back to the infantry. During one of those uh, times, that's when we came upon this complex. There was a, a big gate there, and they also had uh, electric wire charged all around the camp in case you touched them while you was electrocuted. This is one of the gun tires. They had six of these around the prison camp. And this area here where this fence is, all that fence was highly electric, uh, and charged with electricity. There was about maybe three or four thousand people who was locked in the camp. And when the Germans knew that we were coming near an area like that, where well, they usually took off. And we learned later that there was uh, like 12 or 13,000 hostages that was taken out of that camp and put on the forced march to another area. We didn't know what it was, and we learned out later that it was, a, we thought it was a prison camp. And, because we never heard of the word concentration camp or even the word Holocaust. Ray and his wire crew had wandered into the concentration camp in Germany, called Flossenburg. Between 1938, when the camp was established, and liberation in April 1945, more than 96,000 prisoners passed through Flossenburg. Many were political prisoners. About 30,000 died there. For more than an hour, the American soldiers wandered through the camp, the first people to arrive once the Nazis had fled. While we were there, we entered one of the barracks, and these, these heads all popped out of their bunks, and it was like a moment later or so that they recognized we were American soldiers. Well, they come tumbling out of their bunks, and they were screaming and yelling and hugging and kissing us and swarming all over us. And it was a sight that uh, just never been erased from my mind. They were sunken eyes and ashen faces, you know, and their eyes were sunken in. And uh, all of them were like dark complexed and just from malnutrition, I guess it is. And these pictures here are just the barracks of the camp. This camp held around 10 or 15,000 people. And what they did, they had them on 12-hour shifts where half of the camp would be out in the stone quarries or the aircraft factory there, and the other half would be in the barracks. We called back to our outfit to, you know, bring medics up and, and doctor uh, medics, people, and food. Uh, I remember we had K rations that we would give them, and, and as soon as they ate it right after a while, they just come right up because they weren't used to anything like that in their stomach. There was a Polish doctor in the camp that could speak uh, pretty good English, and he, he's the one that took us through the camp and explained to us what was going on in that. The Polish doctor showed the young soldiers the barracks, grounds, and the crematory. The crematory, this particular one, or it was in the camp, they had six ovens. There was uh, three on the each side and three high. They wouldn't put any bodies in there unless they were all filled, you know, and then they cremated them. And uh, outside the crematory, they had a, well, it was a, a pit about six feet in diameter, and uh, but it was almost filled up with ashes up to the top, the human ashes that would take from the crematory. They had this one area where it was a, a big pole, they call it the hanging pole, and they, anybody that escaped, well, they would have everybody come and, and they would beat the guys and hang them, and then take them down to the crematory and then cremate them. And they had the whole camp, maybe 10 or 15,000 people, 
Ray's extraordinary pictures of Flossenburg were taken by his company clerk in the days just after the American soldiers liberated the concentration camp. He's showing them to his grandson, Mike. And this was their main administration building that's still there. And uh, they have one of the barracks there. And uh, the guy took us through the camp. This particular picture here were these pile of shoes when the prisoners were brought into this camp. They got to this area here and they had to take their shoes and throw them over the wall and they gave them wooden shoes. It made a lot of noise. So at nighttime, you know, if anybody was out, they could hear them clomp around. Ray and the other young American soldiers didn't realize the significance of their find. And he didn't learn more about Flossenburg until nearly 50 years later. It was like in 1995. It was the 50th anniversary at the end of the war. And everybody just sort of never talked about anything about the war. It was everything that they went through, all their experiences was sort of kept inside. These are uh, German uh, bayonets. Ray noticed an advertisement asking soldiers to tell their stories. He ended up becoming involved with the Holocaust Center in Pittsburgh, and he met a former concentration camp survivor from Flossenburg who lived in Pittsburgh. I find out uh, down here at the Pittsburgh Holocaust Center some of the survivors that were there and I got in contact with them. I met prisoners from this particular camp and one of them was, lived here in Pittsburgh in the squirrel, squirrel here, his name was Mark Stern. And it was through him that I got most of all this information of what transpired. We a lot of times came down here, or they'd call me and we'd come down we talked different schools, and he would talk as a survivor, and I talked as a liberator. We made a pretty good team for him, but I guess he passed away here three or four years ago, I guess, something like that. He was quite a guy. Why did the Germans have so much hatred against the Jews? Like, did the Jews do something? I always tell the kids, you know, I, I try to educate them in a certain way that they wouldn't have to ever experience uh, 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 an experience like that. And that, uh, the only thing I always stress to them is to always remember the, the, the peace that was won for you and the life you live in this country. At that time, we were only about 20 years old and we never realized the significance of what was happening. The, the concentration camp was something that just you never forgot about.